It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ravinder Jeet Singh, who will present an overview of hyperacute stroke treatment. Dr. Singh is currently an assistant professor at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine and a stroke neurologist at Health Sciences North in Sudbury. He's also the medical director of the Northeastern Ontario Stroke Network. Dr. Singh completed his medical school in India and his neurology training from the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, NIMHANS, also in India. He did a one-year stroke fellowship at NIMHANS before moving to Calgary. He completed his two-year vascular neurology fellowship at the University of Calgary. He has a strong interest in studying the role of brain eloquence in stroke prognosis. He is also passionate about studying long-term outcomes after stroke, cerebral collateral imaging, and symptom imaging correlation in cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Welcome, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Sue. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, so my role here to is to extend what Dr. Deshmukh uh, already uh, spoke about, is once you have a diagnosis of stroke and, and you know that you're dealing with stroke, how to manage stroke uh, in the hyperacute period. And uh, so I'll be talking about uh, both the ischemic st uh, stroke uh, subtype and the ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke subtype. I have no relevant uh, disclosures, um, uh, no disclosure relevant to this presentation. And these are the objectives. Uh, the first is to define what the hyperacute phase of the stroke is. Uh, second is to discuss options which are available to treat uh, uh, patients in the hyperacute uh, phase. And the third is to review approaches to treat uh, stroke subtypes. So as uh, Dr. Deshmukh uh, showed that stroke um, has different presentations and, and a different uh, underlying pathophysiology. So it's, it's not a homogenous disease. Um, and although superficially, uh, most stroke subtypes have common symptoms, which, which is generally captured as, you know, uh, in face arm uh, speech uh, test, uh, each of the stroke subtype has its own distinctive clinical features. And because stroke is not, not a single disease, so also uh, the treatment. And uh, so what I will try to show you in the uh, next several slides is that um, the different types of strokes are treated uh, differently and be becoming familiar with the individual pathways of different stroke uh, subtype is important. So this is the general concept as cardiovascular system is a closed system. So there are two basic types of injuries uh, which can happen uh, to the vessel. One, it, there could be occlusion to the forward flow. And uh, that is what, what, what is defined as uh, ischemic type of a stroke. And the second is there could be a rupture of this closed system. And now the system is open and that leads to hemorrhage. Um, and of course, in the case of brain, it's, it's a, a brain hemorrhage. And depending upon the type uh, of the vascular injury, this leads to a different types of parenchymal injury, which is nothing but a brain injury. So in case of occlusion or ischemia, uh, the brain shows a cytotoxic edema, which is what we call as infarct. While in case of a vessel rupture, uh, the, the parenchyma or the brain shows uh, hemorrhage or hematoma. And, uh, and either the infarct or the hemorrhage can have various clinical manifestation based on the location of that uh, infarct or the hemorrhage. And depending upon how eloquent the brain age uh, or the, that brain area is, you can have either mild to severe uh, manifestation. So it's important to know that a same size of infarct or a same size of hemorrhage can have uh, different uh, severity of clinical manifestation based on where the uh, infarct or the uh, hematoma is located. And that, of course, depends on what part of the brain is affected and what is the loquence. So based on this, you can see there, there are two distinctive uh, subtypes uh, of um, uh, strokes. And uh, so I tried to put some anima animation. Uh, I think for some reason it didn't work. Uh, but I'll see if I can play it again. Uh, so this is, this is the 
clotting type. So if you see on, on the left, the blue side is the venous system, and this is your arterial system. And, uh, and what you see here is you can have a blockage uh, on the arterial side. I should have flipped the side actually. Uh, the right should be left, left should be right because the blue is the venous and uh, the red is arterial. Uh, so if you have a blockage on the arterial side, uh, you get arterial stroke. And this is what, is called, what we call as ischemic stroke. You can also have problem in the microvasculature where there's obstruction. And this leads to a tiny little strokes distally. And this is what we call as microvascular infarcts. And again, this is another type of ischemic stroke. While if the clot is on the venous end, uh, then you get what is called as a venous uh, infarction. Now, this venous stroke is a very uncommon type of a stroke and, and, and it's not frequently discussed. So this is if there is a blockage in the uh, vascular system. What happens if there is a rupture? This is what uh, you see if there is a rupture of the artery you see a hemorrhage in the brain. So in the first type, you have ischemia or occlusion causing uh, ischemia and leading to ischemic stroke. And the second is a vascular rupture causing a hemorrhage into the brain. So those are the two distinct uh, stroke subtypes. Of course, the third one is the venous stroke, uh, which uh, we will not be discussing in uh, this presentation. And of course, once you have any of this uh, occurring, the end result is a clinical manifestation which superficially resembles um, uh, pretty much the same way, which is a facial droop, arm, or leg weakness, and speech involvement. Now, our focus would be on ischemic uh, stroke followed by hemorrhagic stroke. And, and one of the reasons why we uh, focus on is so much on ischemic stroke is because that's the most common type of stroke. Uh, about 85% of the stroke uh, in the Western hemisphere are ischemic. And therefore, the focus is um, on recognizing and treating these patients early. About 15% 15 of the strokes are hemorrhagic in the Western Hemisphere. Of course, in the Eastern Hemisphere, or uh, many of the Asian countries, this number could go up to 30 to 40%. And uh, again, the venous stroke, um, as part of overall stroke population, it constitutes less than 1%. But in some regions of the world, and in certain population, uh, it can constitute a much uh, bigger proportion of patients, especially those uh, having malignancy. But for the uh, sake of this presentation, I'll be talking about the first two categories. And uh, so this is just to give us a um, uh, few facts, and I think uh, other speakers uh, would, uh, uh, would be talking about the, uh, the same facts as well, is to stroke is very common. Uh, it has high morbidity and mortality and has very high economic cost. Um, and it's, it's important to know that, um, that this is a major uh, healthcare problem and, um, and should be treated um, urgently. And so the hyperacute phase of the stroke, it's um, defining hyperacute phase is a kind of a moving target. Uh, although we started uh, with about three years, uh, three hours of uh, a window when the initial um, uh, thrombolysis trial were conducted, and now we are moving on to 24 hours and, and Based on recent imaging, we can see that the, uh, the window is even, even longer in certain cases. So, and the reason for this changing window is that we no, not only look at the clock time, but we also look at the tissue clock, or what we call as a tissue status. And so there are patients uh, who can have variable uh, size of strokes at different time points because they have a different collaterals, uh, or their, their clot is different uh, and might allow some of the flow to happen through it. So based on uh, these variables, uh, not everybody uh, behaves uh, in, a, in a similar fashion. So therefore, it is not only to look at the uh, clock, but also to look at the tissue itself. Uh, and that is why uh, recently there has been a lot of focus on imaging-based patient selection. Uh, because there is a lot of variance based on purely the, uh, uh, the external clock. And clock also differs between ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. We do know that the hemorrhage tends to expand early. So that uh, what that means is that most of the natural history or the early natural history is complete by the time even the patient arrives to the hospital, um, at, which is unlike the ischemia where the, we have much longer window uh, to intervene. And again, similar to ischemic strokes, in even in hemorrhagic stroke, now there's new evidence suggesting 
that not everybody completes their natural history before they arrive. And, and there are patients who might continue to expand their hemorrhage several hours and therefore uh, might potentially benefit uh, from, from the treatment. So as of today, um, we considered up to 24 hours as our cutoff, uh, as arbitrary cutoff um, based on the recent trials uh, for the ischemic stroke. And for hemorrhages, uh, the hyperacute phase is probably first three to six hours. It could be longer in certain, certain cases. And uh, so now we know that there are two major types. We know that there are two types of vascular injury pattern. Uh, how can we treat these two different stroke types? So the first I will be showing you uh, how to treat hyperacute ischemic stroke. So here the focus is basically on three Cs. So first C is the clot, the second is the collateral, the third is the core. And uh, so we try to uh, treat the clot, we try to improve the collateral, and we try to reduce the core size. So that's, that's a general theme when we are trying to manage hyperacute ischemic stroke. And what the intravenous thrombolysis or endovascular thrombectomy does is, is it focuses on the clot. Either we try to lyse the clot or we try to retrieve the clot because that seems to be a primary um, uh, problem. So here, if you see on, on, uh, on this picture, uh, this is the clot and this clot obstruct one of the major artery. And, uh, and what you see here is a small area of tissue damage or what we call as a core. And these are the collateral channels, which allows to bypass uh, this blockage and therefore they are able to supply the blood flow distal to the blockage. Now, depending upon how robust the collaterals are, you might be able to get some flow or you might be able to completely uh, normalize the flow. And therefore, uh, patients who have good collateral or robust collaterals uh, might be having a very small infarct size, uh, even 10 hours, 20 hours uh, into their stroke. While the individuals with the uh, very poor collaterals or no collaterals might be able to complete their entire infarcts in the first hour or two. So collaterals play a huge role in terms of uh, determining what is the tissue clock, uh, how fast the tissue clock is, uh, is running. And uh, so therefore uh, the idea is to always support or augment these collaterals. Uh, and this can be in page, especially relevant in patients with a large vessel occlusion who have a big clots. And these patients after they receive their intravenous thrombolysis are waiting to get transferred uh, to another center or uh, waiting to transfer um, uh, to angio suite in, in the mothership model. Um, and during this time, what you want is to augment these collaterals so that you can reduce the type, uh, reduce the extent of tissue injury. And there are a few ways I'll, I'll be showing briefly uh, you can improve the collaterals. The first is of course to uh, uh, lay the patient flat and, and giving some IV fluids if you think the patient is dehydrated and in certain cases, uh, people are also discussing about um, increasing uh, the blood pressure, although that has not been uh, proven uh, efficacious this far. And, and the third is, of course, uh, to limit the size of the core and, and salvage the penumbra. And, um, and of course, by using different neuroprotective strategies, you might be able to do it, but currently no agent or strategy has been approved. So basically the focus here would be uh, to um, talk about clot and talk about uh, some of the collateral management. And of course, this is more focus approach when we are talking only about the area uh, or artery of interest. Uh, but we also have to remember if somebody has a larger stroke, they also require strategies to improve their uh, intracranial uh, pressure and improve cerebral perfusion, and which is even more relevant in, in, in patients with hemorrhagic stroke. So the first focus is on the clots. So if somebody has ischemic stroke, it's highly likely that there is occlusion. And if this occlusion is in the, one of the major artery, that becomes a large vessel occlusion. And so it, may, it makes sense to open up this artery so that uh, the brain uh, could be salvaged. And so we have two strategies to do that. One is we can use uh, the time-honored uh, approach, which is using clot busting medication or clot lysis using intravenous thrombolysis. And the second approach is mechanical uh, approach where uh, you could use um, uh, small catheters to go up into the brain and pull out the clot, and which is shown on the, on the right side. And, and I'll be showing a little more about uh, both these strategies. And uh, as far as the time windows are concerned, we, we know that um, alteplase 
or intravenous thrombolysis only had um, time window up to four and a half hours. But based on recent evidence, there has been two major trials which showed that it can be safely given and is probably beneficial up to nine hours. Uh, although this has not become uh, um, a standard of care yet. And um, while in case of endovascular thrombectomy, the early evidence uh, suggested the probable benefit only up to um, uh, six to seven hours. Uh, but now we have uh, more trials, uh, especially Don and uh, Diffuse 3 trials, which shows the evidence that uh, the therapy works uh, up to 24 hours. So the, currently uh, for TPA, we are still limited to four and a half hours, uh, while for endovascular thrombectomy, we can treat patient up to 24 hours. And uh, of course, uh, when we are trying to treat patient at a longer time than those, we need additional uh, special imaging uh, to, um, to support patient selection. Uh, when, we, uh, when we have decided that this patient is eligible and, uh, and we have to make sure that the patient meets the eligibility criteria, uh, so of course, any acute ischemic stroke patient becomes uh, potentially eligible um, based on the best practice recommendation. This is the eligibility criteria, which is um, adults uh, with a diagnosis of ischemic stroke who has disabling deficits. So it doesn't... It doesn't uh, necessarily indicate uh, the um, severity captured on um, NIH stroke scale. So it could be NIH stroke scale of two, but if you feel, uh, if you determine the deficit is disabling, um, you can thrombolyze this patient. And of course, uh, for uh, intravenous thrombolysis, we still limit ourselves up to four and a half hours from the symptom onset or from the lossine well. And um, so once those two criteria are met, you're pretty much ready um, for, um, for giving intravenous thrombolysis. Of course, uh, you need imaging uh, to rule, couple, uh, rule out a couple of things. One, you want to rule out any hemorrhage because uh, hemorrhage can um, clinically resemble an ischemic stroke because the deficits are so similar, uh, ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke sometimes are very hard to, or I would say most of the time are very hard to discern or, or, or distinguish clinically. And therefore imaging becomes a cornerstone to distinguish if this stroke is ischemic or hemorrhagic type. And the second important exclusion criteria before uh, for uh, thrombolysis is that the person should not be actively bleeding and uh, or should have a condition which increases the risk of major hemorrhage. So those are the two criteria, and I'll be showing you what are the conditions which can increase the risk of uh, major hemorrhage. And these are the relative contraindications. So that means this is, these are the individuals who have higher risk of bleeding um, and uh, therefore uh, poorer outcomes, uh, or these might be patients who are not uh, uh, stroke patients are uh, stroke mimic, therefore do not require intravenous thrombolysis. So what are the, uh, so this, these have been divided into, um, uh, three major categories um, or, or four major, major categories if, if we include in the, the two investigations that separate. The first is the historical um, uh, or the his, history, uh, patient history. So if somebody had a hemorrhage on the scan, it's an absolute contraindication. But what if somebody has a history of intracranial hemorrhage, but at this point does not have hemorrhage on the scan? So those patients, um, it's, it's a relative contraindication. And in each patient, uh, we need to uh, do a lot of um, um, assessment as to risk versus benefit. Uh, so there are situations where uh, if somebody has a history of previous hemorrhage and, and on current presentation is not a hemorrhagic stroke, we might be able to thrombolyze. Um, and, and this is a topic beyond uh, today's um, uh, presentation, but it's important that if somebody had a, a history of intracranial hemorrhage, it becomes a relative contraindication. So that means you have to stop and discuss uh, before you give thrombolysis. If somebody had a stroke or a serious head or spinal trauma in the preceding three months, it becomes a relative contraindication. And again, you might be able to justify TPA, but you need additional uh, discussion or evidence uh, or to uh, support uh, your rationale. And if there's any major surgery, especially any cardiac, thoracic, abdominal, or major orthopedic surgery in the last two weeks, that again becomes a relative contraindication. That means you have to discuss the risk um, and benefits with the, with, the, with the patient or the family members. If somebody had arterial puncture at a non-compressible site, so non-compressible site could be if, if somebody had a procedure done um, 
in in the um, uh, femoral uh, uh, high femoral area where there's a possible extension to retroperitoneal uh, area, or there was uh, some aortic um, um, procedure done uh, that becomes a non-compressible site. So so those are the cases where you won't be able to uh, apply uh, pressure. Uh, safely, um, if somebody had that in the last seven days, that becomes a relative uh, contraindication. And again, you might still be able to give it, but you need additional discussion. And some of the symptoms you should be aware of, if there's somebody has a symptom suggestive of subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, of course, you won't be giving TPA, um, but uh, the imaging is usually able to help you determine if somebody has a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage and, and not a stroke in, in, in all, almost all the cases in the acute phase. So uh, it's, it's a relative contraindication uh, till you are able to get the imaging. And if somebody has a stroke symptom, which is due to uh, another cause, which is non ischemic, for example, if somebody had a seizure is now weak on one side, or somebody has um, hyper or hypoglycemia causing uh, unilateral weakness, that becomes a relative uh, uh, contraindication because that's not the cause and TP is not gonna help these patients. And if somebody has a, a hypertension, which is refractory to the treatment, um, you have to delay the treatment till uh, you are able to safely bring uh, uh, down the blood pressure in, in the um, acceptable range, which for TPA is below 180 uh, over 105. And if somebody is taking uh, NOAX or vitamin K antagonist, uh, again, uh, it's a relative contraindication. You might be able to give in some cases, uh, but in most cases, if somebody is compliant on a medication, took the medication, uh, you won't be able to give it. And in case of uh, uh, vitamin K antagonist, which is warfarin, um, you have to look at the INR. If INR is um, above 1.7, you will not be able to give uh, TPA. And if uh, CT or MRI shows a big area of infarction already, so in those cases, the benefit is questionable. So you won't be given TPA, it becomes a relative contraindication. And of course, there are some um, variables in the investigation, which is extremes of um, uh, hemostatic parameters. So if INR is high, platelet count is low, uh, or if uh, somebody has uh, an alternative explanation for their symptom like hypo or hyperglycemia, you won't be giving it. And um, so once, once you determine that this patient is eligible uh, for TPA, you ruled out the contraindication, uh, what are the uh, minimum things you have to do before starting the TPA? The first is we have to make sure that the blood pressure is below 180, uh, 110. That's the before giving TPA. What's, once you start the TPA, you have to maintain it below 180, 105. So there's a slight difference uh, before starting and, and maintenance. And the second is, you have to uh, ensure that you assess the severity at, at baseline. So you can use a standardized um, um, tool for this. Uh, the, the most common tool is NIH uh, stroke scale. And this is shown here, it's an 11 point scale with the, with the values ranging from zero to 42. And uh, any, anybody between zero and five is usually considered mild, between five and 15 is considered moderate and more than 15 is considered having severe stroke. And you also need to assess baseline uh, disability, uh, which can be captured in modified ranking score. And this modified ranking score is uh, between zero and six, um, uh, which, which basically captures how uh, well the person was uh, functioning uh, before their stroke. And, um, and any score below three is considered um, uh, a good score. And once, you have the baseline assessment done. Uh, you are basically ready to give a TPA now. And um, so the agent which is now approved is Altiplase, uh, which, is, um, which comes by two or uh, three different brands. Um, but the, the constituent is the Altiplase. Uh, there is now um, hope that the Tenecteplase will uh, soon be approved, uh, but we, we are still um, not there yet. Uh, but if there is some um, major trial which is near completion. Uh, for now, LTPlase is our go-to agent. Uh, the dose is, total dose is 0.9 um, milligrams per kilo. Sorry for um, this typo error. Uh, maximum dose is uh, 90 milligrams. Uh, we give 10% as bolus over one minute, and uh, the 90% is given as infusion. So, of course, we use infusion pumps for, for that. And then patient uh, is monitored. And uh, so what kind of monitoring do we need? The monitoring can be done in eMERGE, uh, can be done in ICU or stroke unit. It depends on um, 
the institution. There are stroke units which had a hyperacute bed, other places uh, monitor in the ICU, while in some cases if there's no bed available, the initial monitoring is done in emergency department. The key parameters to look for, and again, I'm not providing the exhaustive list, but this is, I think, is the, is the key um, uh, parameter which needs to be monitored. First is we have to look for any bleeding. So any bleeding from the nose, any bleeding from the mouth, any bleeding in the urine, uh, any bleeding manifestations. Um, assess the site and severity. The second is the angioedema. And if somebody starts to um, show any swelling of the lips, swelling of the tongue, uh, start to have strider uh, or difficulty breathing, uh, suspect angioedema and assess severity. And it's important that in both the cases, uh, you will need to interrupt uh, or stop uh, your IV infusion for TPA. Till we are able to uh, um, assess the safety of further continuing um, the uh, TPA in case the event is very minor. And, um, but in most cases, once there's a bleeding or angioedema, we have to stop, discontinue the infusion right away. Uh, the other thing to monitor is the blood pressure and make sure that our blood pressure stays below 180-105. And uh, from the neuro perspective, we have to monitor NIH and uh, look for any um, symptoms of uh, bleeding into the brain, which is headache or nausea, vomiting. And sometimes it could be sudden surge in the blood pressure. The blood pressure was fine and suddenly spikes. That could be one of the signals that there could be a bleeding into the brain. And we should delay uh, placing any source of tubes because that creates uh, another potential site for injury. And then you will have to monitor that site as well. And now, of course, in certain cases, we are left with no choice and we have to do it. But it's important that if you end up placing a, a, a catheter or, or a tube, um, there's a likelihood of minor trauma. And you know if the TPA is given, it, it becomes a, a major hemorrhage from that location. So whenever possible, avoid placing any of the tubes or catheters. And uh, the measurement uh, is performed every 15 minutes in the first couple of hours, and then every 30 minutes for six hours, and uh, then hourly until 24 hours uh, after the treatment, uh, if the TP is given. And now I alluded to two of the major complications, which is bleeding and angioedema. And if you find this, this is a standard uh, approach uh, in case of the uh, bleeding, stop the infusion, get stat uh, CDC uh, and coags and the fibrinogenic levels and cross match, get an urgent uh, CT and, um, and get ready. And if you are able to demonstrate that there was hemorrhage, get ready to uh, give cryo um, or trizexemic acid um, and, and consult hematology and neurosurgery. Now, if you find there's angioedema, again, you discontinue the uh, TPA, and look for any ACE inhibitors if patient was receiving it earlier, any of the remiprols and uh, all those uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, stop them, discontinue them, and uh, give um, a combination of methylprednisolone, um, diphenhydramine, um, and ranitidin or thamotidin, which is available locally. And uh, usually this is given as a cocktail, uh, all three are given together. And, um, and some of the um, pharmacies might have um, uh, one of the bradykinin uh, antagonists, uh, ecatibant, and uh, that can be given. Uh, and uh, in certain cases, um, epinephrine is also required. Uh, get ready because this patient might require endotracheal intubation. So, um, uh, and if it is severe enough, then certainly it requires uh, endotracheal intubation. Even in patients who are progressing and are mild and you suspect that this can progress further, uh, it's, it's better to uh, intubate these patients. Um, and again, um, it's, it's um, a case by case uh, decision um, uh, when to intubate. And so this is about the um, uh, clot busting medication or uh, the intravenous thrombolysis. And what about endovascular thrombectomy? Now, one thing which is very <clears throat> reassuring or uh, interesting is that we are not too much worried about contraindication because there are very little contraindication. And actually the endovascular thrombectomy could be done in many of those patients who have contraindication for TPA, as long as they fulfill rest of the criteria. Similar to the TPA or uh, intravenous thrombolysis, uh, you need, the first two criteria are very similar, except uh, this time the, the time window is up to 24 hours. And you need a demonstration of a large vessel occlusion. So that means there has to be a big occlusion in the artery. 
uh, and large vessel occlusion is any occlusion in the major uh, intracranial artery, which could be internal carotid artery, the middle cerebral artery, or the anterior cerebral artery. But for most practical purposes, we treat um, uh, intracranial internal, uh, internal carotid artery and the middle cerebral artery or its immediate branches. In certain cases, basal artery occlusion can also be treated by endovascular thrombectomy, uh, especially if uh, the symptoms are uh, significant. And, and again, this is case by case. There are uh, no uh, big trials which showed um, efficacy of EBT in basal artery occlusion. So as, as far as the current guidelines are concerned, they recommend uh, or the recommendation or standard of care is uh, for the uh, ICA and MCA occlusions. And uh, the infarct has to be small or moderate. So that means there is still a lot of brain which can be saved. And pre-morbidly, the patient should be independent and the life expectation, the, uh, expectancy should be greater than three months. That means if somebody is having a terminal cancer, if somebody is uh, terminally ill, um, we should not be uh, rushing for the endovascular thrombectomy uh, in, in, in these patients. Uh, and pre-AVT, similar to what we do for pre-TPA, um, we need to check the blood pressure, document the stroke severely, assess the disability. It's very similar to what we do in, in, in case of um, uh, TPA. And um, so this is the procedure. Uh, usually the axis is femoral. So that means we go from the femoral site. In some cases, the radial axis or the carotid axis uh, uh, could be uh, uh, obtained. And uh, after that, we um, try to <clears throat> use different catheters uh, to navigate through the arteries uh, to go up to the clot. So if you go from the, uh, from the left panel, uh, this is the catheter in the, in the neck. And from here, a micro catheter is passed. This is a clot, you go through the clot. And over that, you advance. So this is a micro wire, sorry, uh, over which you pass the micro catheter. And through the micro catheter in the left lower uh, panel, you can see there's a stent retriever which is collapsed uh, in, in, in the, um, in the microcatheter. And then this is deployed. Now you can see the stent uh, retriever, it expands and it, it, it integrates the clot into it. And thereafter you inflate the balloon in the neck and then pull the catheter out with the clot in it. And, um, and once this is done, um, you basically remove the entire system and the access site, which is usually a femoral artery, is closed with the angio seal, which is a, a which is a closure device. And uh, thereafter, the uh, patient is is monitored. And and again, the monitoring site could be emerged, could be ICU and stroke unit. It depends on again um, where the bed is available and what the institution practices. And what we look for is it's very again very similar to NIH. The only additional thing is we have to look for uh, the um, puncture site, uh, which in most cases is, of course, the femoral site. So we have to monitor the groin for any bleeding complications and also look at the pedal pulses or, or, or the leg pulses to make sure that this patient is uh, not developing any ischemic symptoms in that leg. And uh, as far as the frequency is concerned, it depends on whether patient received the TPA, which then follows the TPA guidelines. If patient did not receive TPA, then again, it, it, it weighs uh, institution to institution, but generally it's, it's fairly similar. Uh, we, we do every 30 minutes um, uh, for a couple of hours, then every hour for up to six, uh, six hours or, or even longer. Uh, and again, it's based on um, where the patient is, is, uh, is being monitored and how the patient is responding. And as far as the leg is concerned, again, there are different institutional protocols, uh, but generally speaking, um, the, the idea is not to move the, uh, the puncture leg, uh, which is the site which, is site which was used to access the artery for the first uh, several hours, which could be anywhere between four and six hours, again, depending upon the institution. And after that, uh, we can start uh, moving if, if, if appropriate. And um, so, so it's very similar to what we do in TPA. The only addition is the puncture site, uh, which is usually a femoral site uh, in the uh, monitoring. And one of the important things which I want to highlight in the monitoring, if somebody develops a sudden drop in pressure, uh, it, the person could be bleeding in the retroperitoneal space because usual site, uh, puncture site is uh, ephemeral and these patients can have uh, bleeding into the retroperitoneal uh, peritoneal space and can lose a lot of blood and causing drop in pressure. So not only high blood pressure should be monitored, but also low blood pressure in patients who receive uh, EBT. 
And um, either patient uh, who received uh, TPA or, or intravenous thrombolysis or patient receiving EVT, both of them require, uh, generally require um, uh, bed rest for the first uh, several hours. And then most institutions, it's uh, generally uh, the first 24 hours that they are in bed rest. And the head end could be um, flat or it could be elevated depending upon uh, what what is the desired outcome here? Uh, so if 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 some if there's somebody uh, where we want uh, is waiting for transfer um, and hasn't want, hasn't been treated, so we want to improve their cerebral perfusion and we want to keep them flat. Uh, but if some this is someone who is um, immediate post procedure post EVT and everything has opened up, you can raise the head and uh, uh, to up to thirty degree. And also, if, if somebody you suspect high risk of aspiration, then in those patients, they had it could be um, elevated 30 degree. Uh, patients should remain NPO uh, until swallowing uh, screen is uh, uh, completed for patient safety, which could be either the same day or the next day. And uh, as far as the vitals are concerned, um, a temperature if it goes above 37.5, treat with the uh, 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 acetaminophen. Oxygenation wise, um, if the patient drops their saturation below 94, uh, supplement with oxygen. And if the blood pressure uh, um, uh, goes above 180 or 105, these patients need to, to be uh, treated. And we can use uh, labetalol or hydralazine uh, for this. Um, and glucose, and if uh, it falls below four or goes above 10, it uh, should be treated. And uh, obtain a follow-up uh, CT or MRI at 24 hours after treatment before we start any forms of uh, antiplatelet or anticoagulant agents. So this is very common to both uh, groups. Now, this is about um, uh, treating patient with ischemic stroke. And what about hemorrhagic stroke? And uh, so I'll go a little quicker uh, as far as the hemorrhage is concerned. Um, I would say uh, there are two major themes. Um, one is we have to reduce the hematoma expansion. And two, we can evacuate the hematoma if, if, if it is large. And there are several strategies um, which can be used, um, either open surgicals, you can do a craniotomy and, and remove the clot. You can do a, a endoscopic uh, a clot rem uh, removal. You can use a stereotactic clot removal, or you can merely uh, just open up a, a skull and leave it open, which is what we call as decompressive uh, hemicraniotomy, with or without hematoma. Removal. So there are several strategies which can be employed uh, in, in a patient with um, uh, hemorrhage. And so the first, as far as the first part is concerned, uh, all patients, they are admitted to um, either stroke unit and ICU. Again, similar to what we do in ischemic stroke, but rest till we prove that hematoma is stable. Head end is usually elevated to 30 degree um, uh, in hemorrhages. Uh, it is invariably uh, to reduce intracranial pressure and patients should be NPO uh, till the swallowing screen is completed. And similar to what we do in ischemic stroke, uh, we target, we treat the um, temperature about 37.5, uh, supplement oxygen when needed, and uh, treat extremes of uh, glucose levels. And how can we prevent hematoma growth? Uh, so there are two, two uh, standard ways. One is we can uh, drop the pressure. And uh, uh, in general, uh, if the blood pressure is uh, between 150 and 220, uh, we can drop it below 140 safely. Uh, if it is uh, pressure is above 220, um, in these cases, uh, tr uh, trying to drop to 140 or below 140 becomes uh, a, a major drop. So in those cases, uh, you could be a bit cautious. You can drop it about by 25% in the first hour or two, and then you can continue to drop it um, uh, below one, uh, 140 over the next several hours. So, so it's a more gradual reduction, uh, while the initial uh, sudden reduction could be up to 25%. And again, that is um, uh, in keeping with their autoregulation. And um, uh, if somebody has coagulopathy, um, then definitely they need some sort of uh, factors or, or platelet infusion, depending upon what kind of um, uh, um, coagulopathy they have. So if it is a factor deficiency, if somebody has one bilibrant disease or some other uh, inherited uh, factor deficiency, then in those cases, we replace factor. And in case of severe thrombocytopenia, uh, transfusion uh, of platelet is needed. If somebody um, is on antithrombotics, uh, in those cases also, we can reverse. Uh, and uh, in case of vitamin K antagonists or warfarin, we can First step, of course, is to hold um, uh, warfarin, and the second is replace factors. Generally, the PCC or uh, octoplex is uh, uh, recommended over uh, fresh frozen uh, plasma. And in case of uh, newer agents, um, 
uh, if the the loss and take was in the last couple of hours, you can give um, uh, activated charcoal. Um, in case of um, uh, Pradaxa, you can use Praxbind, uh, otherwise uh, consider giving PCC. In case of heparin, uh, you can um, reverse it with uh, protamin sulfate if it is unfractionated heparin, otherwise you can give uh, PCC in, um, uh, in these cases. And uh, as far as antiplatelet agents are concerned, there is nothing which has been approved. Um, and uh, there was a patch trial which showed that a platelet tr transfusion does not help. And if patient is not coagulopathic and has ICH, there's no clear benefit of using transexamic acid or um, uh, recombinant factor seven, although this has been tried in the several trials. As far as the hematoma evacuation is concerned, again, for the sake of time, I won't go into uh, the entire list, but what I, I could say that at this point, apart from cerebellar uh, hematomas, in most cases, uh, patient uh, are not um, uh, treated um, uh, as far as the hematoma evacuation are concerned. In some cases, um, if it is a, a progressive deficit and, 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 and the goals of years are, are quite clear and patient was highly functional, uh, there it could be one is to one discussion. And in, in, in those cases, uh, minimally invasive approaches or even open craniotomy could be tried. But in general, uh, apart from the cerebellar ICH, uh, most ICH um, are not offered any, any surgeries. Um, or there is no benefit of the surgery in, in those patients. Of course, they can be offered. Uh, as far as the intraventricular hemorrhage is concerned, uh, a ventricular drainage uh, could be done in patients who have hydrocephalus related to the IVH, uh, especially if it is associated with reduced uh, level of consciousness or a patient is progressively getting worse. Um, as far as the um, level of alertness is concerned, there's no a clear benefit of, of adding antiplase to the um, ventricular drainage uh, as shown in CLEAR uh, 3 trial. Uh, which, which showed that if you add uh, TPA into um, the EVD, it really does not help uh, much as far as the functional outcome is concerned. Managing hydrocephalus is important. It could be um, a cerebellar hemorrhage or it could be a, a, a big cerebellar infarct. In those cases, ventricular drainage becomes uh, important in addition to doing a decompression if needed. And um, ICP monitoring, again, this may not be very crucial uh, in most settings, uh, but in some settings, and if you have the availability and expertise um, uh, in patients who have severe um, level of reduced uh, consciousness or who are having uh, features of uh, herniation, um, ICP monitoring could be done. And um, the idea is to uh, ensure that they have enough cerebral perfusion pressure. And as far as the infarct-related and medical complications are concerned, Dr. Kavas will be talking about uh, uh, this. And uh, that's uh, pretty much it. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Dr. Singh, for uh, that's very interesting. We're now gonna take a few questions. Please type your questions into the Ask a Question box and I'll read them out for Dr. Singh. Also a reminder to click on the evaluation survey for this session, and it can be found on the right side of your screen. So um, our first question from Dr. Kavas: if 24-hour repeat MRI show microhemorrhagic transformation, tiny spot, do you still start antiplatelets or DOAX? Yeah, I think this is um, uh, one of the important questions we all face in, um, uh, in practically in most patients. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we, uh, many of us don't like getting MR um, uh, 24 hours later, because it, it shows up a lot more than what is seen on CT. And uh, CT has already been a standard uh, before starting antiplatelet. So uh, again, to answer this question, uh, usually there are three variables uh, which we need uh, to take into consideration, or at, at least I take into consideration. The first itself is the infarct size as to how big the, uh, big the infarct is. Uh, and then we put that hemorrhage into that infarct size perspective. Uh, and, and there are standardized way to uh, grade hemorrhagic uh, transformation into type one, type uh, two, and then hematoma type one, type two. So usually if it is a hematoma type two, it's, it's usually a contraindication. Uh, hemorrhagic um, transformation type one, which, is, which means that there are particular um, tiny little spots it is not, not a contraindication because it has uh, not been shown to adversely affect the patient outcome. And uh, it, it really doesn't correlate well with the uh, uh, future hemorrhage progression risk. 
Uh, type 2 and hematoma type 1 is kind of a borderline where you have to use uh, other discretion. Uh, where That's where the third type of variables come in, where you have to look for, uh, make sure that, you know, um, uh, the blood pressure is uh, uh, well within limits. If uh, somebody has high blood pressure, I would I would probably refrain um, and delay antiplatelet in, in, in that setting. So if you have a large stroke with hemat uh, particular uh, transformation with uncontrolled blood pressure, it's, it's a different scenario compared to a person with a smaller stroke, particular transformation and run control blood pressure. And, um, and also we have to look at the other variables, including the platelet uh, count. So if you don't see other variables, which increase the risk and those are negative and it's a small to moderate side stroke and there are uh, type one uh, transformation, then it's safe to start. Uh, but if you have larger stroke, or you have a larger type of hemorrhagic transformation or any of the other variables, modifiable variables not being still controlled, then in those cases, we will delay um, and maximize uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, those variables first, uh, control those variables first before starting these patients on antiplatelet. And again, the timing depends on the size and the, again, the extent of transformation. So a lot of people still follow this 1, 3, 6, um, uh, 12 rule. And once you have a hemorrhagic transformation, it kind of pushes you uh, on the later time points. I'm not sure if you, it, it uh, entirely uh, answered the question, but if there's anything, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you have a follow-up question to that, just put it in the ask a question box. Anybody else that has a question, please type it into the ask a question box and I'll relay it to Dr. Singh. Um, can you share a bit more, Dr. Singh, about the EVT program at HSN and the team that's involved there? Yeah, I'm not sure if uh, one of the pictures is uh, up. Um, uh, so yeah, you can... we'll put that up for yeah. you. Okay. Uh, so, yes. So, uh, we started it. Uh, the, the first EVT was done in February 2020. And uh, since then, uh, we have done, um, I believe there were 15... Um, in the first year and a half, and then we um, have done over 30 now. So we are close to close to 50 thrombectomies in the last uh, two and a half, uh, close to two and a half years. Um, and a lot of, there were a lot of stakeholders, there were a lot of uh, uh, people who, who came um, and joined and left, and, and there are a lot more who are still staying with us. Uh, and in, in the picture, you can, uh, you, you can see many of the, uh, members who were involved in the first thrombectomies, and I would say most of them are still there, except uh, um, uh, except our uh, interventional uh, neuroradiologist um, uh, uh, who who left. Uh, but most of uh, other people are still there. You can see the in the second row, the the small man, Dr. Priola. Uh, he he and I we worked uh, uh, almost uh, over a year. Uh, on every thrombectomy, and uh, we were only the two uh, who were taking um, uh, basically every patient to the angio suite. So it, it was uh, interesting because we were practically on call every day, uh, except over the weekends. And, and you know, of course, uh, in some cases, we made exception into after hours. So, uh, but now we have uh, two other key members uh, who have joined, Dr. Ruba uh, and Dr. Uh, Ruba Kivan and Dr. Deshmukh, um, uh, who uh, are uh, really helping, and and we now have three interventionalists, uh, and uh, Dr. Deshmukh is also a stroke neurologist, and he and I, we basically share the uh, the most of the stroke calls, uh, uh, and ICU uh, group has been uh, uh, supporting us all along, and uh, and they are still uh, the key uh, people who are um, who are behind the success of this program, and and there are a lot of people who are not are not in this picture, and I was trying to figure out. Uh, find out some of the other pictures, but uh, uh, at last minute couldn't couldn't find out. But uh, uh, it has been it has been an interesting journey, and then we learned quite a bit because we kind of built up uh, this from the scratch, um, and uh, uh, from the the physician side to the nursing side to the allied health to uh, uh, practically every. Um, department and every stakeholder. I, I kind of you know. We went through um, uh, uh, tiny little processes and and tried to uh, try to build it up and and, and we are quite happy and pleased with uh, with our results and uh, and it seems to be picking up quite well and we are becoming a, a bigger volume center and, and and we are hoping that we'll be hitting probably close to sixty thrombectomies uh, every year 
uh, from, from this year onwards. Yeah, really great. Thanks for sharing a team picture. Um, we went 24 seven, which date was that? Dr. Uh, it was November the 15th. Uh, and I should mention that, uh, uh Susan Bercy, who is our, um, uh, regional uh, stroke director and, uh, Dr. Puranam, who is not in, there in the picture, um, and uh, Dr. Uh, and Lisa uh, Zeman, uh, who is our stroke um, um, unit manager, uh, they they have been very influential. And and I would say, you know, before I started, uh, they kind of already had set the foundation, so it was uh, way easier for me to build on that. Uh, but I would I would give a lot of credit to them than uh, than. Uh, 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 the physicians who have been so all, all the other people in the in the team were, has been really instrumental. Right, lots of key players, and uh, just from my experience in watching the outcomes, it it really is a miracle. And to be able to offer this twenty four seven in the Northeast, closer to home, uh, I think is really making a big difference in a lot of people's lives. So thank you and your team for um, the excellent work with the uh, EVT program for sure. Yeah. And the last, I also want to thank all the regional uh, people who have been really, really helpful. So the team from Timmins, North Bay, Susan Marie, and uh, I think uh, uh, the timely referral, and also they have supported um, all steps which we took to improve our transfers and repatriation, and and they were supportive all throughout. So, so we really want to thank uh, them as well because uh, it, it was it was. An effort from the uh, from the region to the region, and and we are still working and, and trying to improve our processes and and hopefully we'll start reducing the time over over coming years. Uh, and we are starting some new projects to look into variables which uh, we can leverage on to improve patient outcomes. So uh, mm-hmm. so there are a lot of QI project which is uh, which is in the pipeline. Excellent, excellent. And did you want to mention the um, regional stroke rounds that you're doing? And you speak of the region and oh, yes. how they're uh, supportive. Mm-hmm. So, so that's uh, that's kind of um, uh, wherever uh, uh, it was kind of our dream project because we wanted to not only uh, build the capacity but also um, educate um, uh, everyone and share some of the experience and uh, the knowledge. So we started stroke uh, regional stroke rounds. The intent was that everybody brings their patients uh, wherever they find it interesting, uh, has some key messages, or it is difficult uh, to manage. And um, uh, everybody puts their brain together and try to um, uh, get the get the right for the patient, whether that could be uh, sending the patient to a to HSN or to a different facility. And uh, we have uh, good support from uh, from the um, uh, UHN. Uh, and here we have a lot of capacity and we have started uh, doing um, uh, carotid uh, stenting and we are doing more procedures and, and basically the, the expertise there, it's, it's basically uh, we, are, we are asking uh, the administration to support us more and more in terms of uh, starting a complete and comprehensive neurovascular program. So, so it's, it's, uh, we are taking baby steps and a uh, lot has been done and still more to, uh, still a lot more to come. Um, and, and you are welcome to bring your cases and it, it is on Tuesdays uh, between seven and eight. It's a bit early. Um, mm-hmm. And we usually discuss anywhere between three to five patients and uh, it's, it's a clinical presentation uh, talking about imaging, talking about management and, uh, and everybody basically share their, their opinions. So, so you're welcome to bring your uh, patients if you have any. Uh, it'll be an it'll be a, a interesting discussion. Yeah, for sure. And it's really pulled the team across the Northeast together. Um, some really great mentoring going on. So we thank you for that. If people are interested in regional stroke rounds, they can email myself or Dr. Singh and we'll happily share the link with you. So you can join bright and early on Tuesday mornings at 7 a.m. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add, uh, Dr. Uh, Singh, before we wrap up? No, I just want to thank everybody. Uh uh, for last, it's it's my third year uh, in Sudbury, uh, and and in the Northeast, and uh, I would say I was lucky to get such a warm welcome and support from everybody. Um, and and Sue has been really um, uh, <laughs> key person to to keep me on track for many of uh, many of the uh, uh, these presentation. And thank you, Sue. And she she has been working really hard to uh, to bring the education piece. Uh, to the region and uh, and no, I, I really want to thank everybody 
Um, and I'm happy uh, to, you, you have my emails. If, if you don't, uh, you can, you can um, send an email to Sue and then we can, uh, we, I can share my email. I think most of you have my cell numbers too. Uh, so you can text me um, and reach me. So yeah, and uh, thank you everyone for all the support. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Dr. Singh. Uh, thanks for a great talk and uh, for sharing uh, your information and you're very knowledgeable and we're so happy to have stroke neurologists working with us now in the Northeast. We can't tell you how great it's been. So thanks again for uh, sharing with us this morning.